Ukraine's political crisis, which way now? In the interview, former president of the European Parliament, Pat Cox. Mr. Cox, has the European Union lost Ukraine? That's a very dramatic way to put the question. When you're dealing with a complex process, I think the idea that there's some finite end point is too dramatic. Uh, there's no doubt that what did not happen in Vilnius was a disappointment. Which was a summit with the Eastern. A summit of Eastern partnership. Ukraine decided one week before at a, a meeting of the uh, cabinet of ministers of the government uh, to suspend the signature. Uh, this was dramatic, this was disappointing. President Yanukovych uh, told at the summit meeting, which I had the privilege to uh, attend and to, to, to hear at first hand, that his strategy to connect Ukraine to Europe remains unchanged. And without being naive, but taking the good faith of what people tell you into account, uh, I would say it's too dramatic to say failure and end. I would say in the grammar of the moment, it is a comma, but not necessarily a full stop. But it looks like Russia has won a tug of war. Do you agree? I think the real question to do with you know, this tug is Ukraine is an independent and sovereign state. And it is important, especially under the Helsinki Accords, that we respect the independence and sovereignty of states. My feeling was looking at the nature of the targeted Russian commercial pressure in addition to other pressures, that from that perspective, they accept that Ukraine is independent and sovereign, but in some parts of its sovereignty, that it is unfree to exercise that sovereignty. Russia, Ukraine and the EU, EU will come back later to this. You are serving as a special envoy of the European Parliament together with former Polish president Alexander Kraszniewski. What is the exact goal of your mission to Ukraine? Uh, we were privileged interlocutors between the European Union in general and uh, Ukraine on three specific sets of issues. The first and primary issue was on the question of selective justice. Former ministers including, but not only, uh, Mrs. Timoshenko who were in prison. There was a strong humanitarian dimension to do with uh, health, particularly for Mrs. Timoshenko, also for Mr. Lutsenko, the former interior minister, and also for Mr. Ivashenko, the former acting defense minister. We, this then spread, if I might say, to a wider uh, connection and conversation on reform questions, electoral reform, uh, judicial reform, prosecution service reform. Where did these reforms come from? These were the conditions set by the Foreign Affairs Council of the ministers of the member states of the European Union and we were invited to encourage Ukrainian government and opposition forces who frankly don't trust each other and don't work with each other in Verkhovna Rada at least on the European agenda to find the serenity and the wisdom to work together and I think in that the mission made considerable progress. The EU had made Mrs. Timoshenko's release to, to secure her release for medical treatment abroad in Germany, presumably, as a precondition to sign the treaty in Vilnius. But in the dramatic days, you just mentioned these talks between the Ukrainian leadership and Russia, in these dramatic days, the EU dropped this package deal. Do you think this was the right decision? I think, I think the best way to interpret it and understand this is that the foreign ministers in December 2012 set three conditions. They were electoral reform, judicial prosecution reform, and dealing with questions of selective justice. The foreign ministers, if you read their conclusions carefully, never closed the door on Ukraine. They had set the conditions. They never said precisely whether the conditions are absolute and how they will review them at the end. They were due to consult each other in the week of the Vilnius summit. But by that time, having kept the door open, we discovered that Ukraine had at least temporarily decided to close the door. Yes, but at the same time, Mrs. Timoshenko has become such a symbol figure and now her fate looks somewhat second rate. 
Well, this is one of the reasons why President Kwasniewski and myself, among many reasons, are willing in principle to resume a mission. It's in a different circumstance, but only in the conditions that such a mission would be acceptable to all sides, governmental and opposition in Ukraine. As regards Mrs. Timoshenko, I think it is extremely important to understand that vigilance matters. There is a duty of care on the European institutions and on member states to remain vigilant in her case and that vigilance should have a strong humanitarian focus because as we know from the diagnosis of the doctors of the Charité Clinic in Berlin, she needs operations. I'm sure in principle and in practice such operations could take place in Ukraine but the truth is unhappily and for reasons that you know are not maybe entirely fanciful Mrs. Timoshenko does not want to have any invasive medical process inside Ukraine. She doesn't trust the system. Many analysts say the EU was completely unprepared for that geopolitical power game the Russians President Putin then started. Do you share this view? I think, it's a very, I think that's a very good question and I think it's a question the European Union will need to reflect on carefully. I think uh, this whole neighborhood is a neighborhood that plays on the Russian side by different rules. So I think what we've got to do is to be engaged, as we have been, but not to be naive. Russia, like other states, in principle, should respect the independence and sovereignty of Ukraine, but in practice, when the sovereign Ukraine appeared to indicate a preference to sign a European agreement, uh, Russia has not been able to accept that and made interventions economically that were critical. And I think when we see people now in the street on the other side, uh, Europe has to understand that this manifestation we see uh, of popular opinion, it shows something of a, a qualitative difference uh, to what is happening in Ukraine today. It's not the politics of 2004, it's the people of 2013 giving a strong people's expression. And opinion polls have shown this. Whether even in eastern Ukraine, let alone western Ukraine, which traditionally was more western orientated, young Ukraine clearly wishes to connect to the idea, the ideal, to the transformative capacity of a European engagement, and that's what we're now seeing in the streets. Russian officials have warned the West, warned the EU, warned you, do not interfere in Ukrainian internal affairs. What do you respond? I would say I agree 100% with that, but I don't, uh, I don't, frankly, I don't buy any Russian propaganda. Let me explain the mission we had was a mission of assistance, not of interference. A mission by invitation, not by self-appointment. A mission whose mandate was renewed on four occasions with the express approval of the government of Ukraine, of the opposition of Ukraine, and of the leaders of every political group in the European Parliament. And only in those conditions were Kwasniewski and myself prepared to work in a system where we were invited to assist, but not to interfere. I saw terms being used uh, by Russians, you know, the watchdog kind of term about Kwasniewski and myself. Um, you know, people are entitled to use whatever propagandistic images they want. But I want to tell you this, we neither barked nor bit, unlike some Russians who bit quite a lot in the last few months reflecting upon future relations between the EU and Russia. Is Russia a partner or a rival? My strong view all along, and it remains my view, is that a zero-sum politics European Union to Russia makes no sense, meaning one side wins, one side loses. This is the formula typically where sometimes everyone loses. And so the indispensable quality of an EU-Russian engagement uh, is a win-win potential for both sides. That said, in the Eastern Partnership policy, which is now there for five years, there should be some principles, which are already in principle signed up to by everyone that should be respected. One is the integrity of the borders of states, and two is the integrity of the sovereignty of, uh, the, the principle of sovereignty of states. And frankly, in this case, the sovereignty of an independent Ukraine to be able to exercise an independent sovereign judgment was interfered with by a third party. 
Mr. Cox, let's look ahead what to do in the weeks to come. What should the EU do in Ukraine now? What will you be doing? I think for the European Union, and right now, we have to give a very clear message. U Ukraine is, is in a, a very fragile place. To the authorities, the message, please respect the right of free assembly and the right of free expression. And please do not unleash security forces against unarmed civilians going about their ordinary democratic rights and expression. To the people in Maidan and up and down the country in Ukraine, please be there, express what you want, but do not engage in acts of provocation or violence. Europe has said it keeps the door open. That is good, but that is passive. We must not simply abandon Ukraine to where fate will bring it. Uh, the path of history is not paved. And so we don't know where it goes. And it's important that we stand ready and willing to assist the pathway to dialogue. It is the European way. If we've learned to do anything well in Europe, and God knows as many things don't work so well in Europe today, but if there's something that does work well, it's the ability to find consensus where before there was discord and disaster. And that is the core raison d'etre of Europe. And it is a philosophy that needs to be animated in our engagement with today's Ukraine. Pat Cox, Special Envoy of the European Parliament to Ukraine, thank you very much for joining us on Deutsche Welle. My pleasure.